Good evening and welcome to today's BIC streams for our program on Ambassador Al Nazareth's recent book, A Ringside Seat to History. Uh, this program is in collaboration with the International Music and Arts Society. We are honored to have with us today a panel of eminent speakers, the author, Ambassador Nazareth, Ambassador Lata Reddy, who will moderate the discussion, Ambassador Gurjit Singh, and Professor Geeta Tarampal. <clears throat> Welcome to you all. <clears throat> For some brief introductions, Ambassador Alan Nazareth, in his 35 year diplomatic career, was India's Consul General in Chicago and New York, Deputy High Commissioner in London, High Commissioner to Ghana, and Ambassador to Egypt and Mexico. He was Director General of the ICCR during the Festivals of India. His book, Gandhi's Outstanding Leadership, has come out in 12 Indian and 23 foreign languages. Ambassador Nazareth has given talks and screenings on opera, one of his passions for both the BIC and the International Music and Arts Society, and we are very pleased to have him back this evening. Ambassador Lata Reddy served as Ambassador of India to Portugal and to Thailand. She was Secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs and was India's Deputy National Security Advisor in the Prime Minister's office. Ambassador Gurjit Singh has been the Ambassador of India to Germany, Indonesia, Timor-Leste, ASEAN, Ethiopia, Djibouti, and the African Union. He's written several books on India's relations with Ethiopia, Japan, Indonesia, and Germany, and is an honorary professor of humanities at the Indian Institute of Technology, Indore. Professor Geeta Dharampal was professor and head of the Department of History at Heidelberg University, and presently honorary dean of research at the Gandhi Research Foundation in Jalgaon, from where she's speaking to us today. She has two PhDs from the Sorbonne and from Freiburg, and her research ranges from the pre-modern interactions between Europe and India, and the maritime history of the Indian Ocean, to the colonial period with an emphasis on Mahatma Gandhi's movement. More detailed bios for the speakers are on our website and in the chat box. After the discussion, the speakers will take questions from the audience. You can type your questions in the Q&A box as we go along. And with that, I will turn the floor over to our moderator for the evening, Ambassador Lata Reddy. Thank you, Pratiti. First, may I say what an honor it is to be with Ambassador Nazareth and to talk to him about his book, which I can assure you is a most fascinating read, A Ringside Seat to History. It takes us through the career. You've heard some of the details already from Pratiti. And as his junior colleague, it has been my pleasure and privilege to, to watch him in action in many of these, uh, these roles. Uh, I think we all want to hear from the man of the hour. So uh, all I would end with is saying that I'm so delighted that we both decided to settle in Bangalore and we could continue our long personal and professional association. So let me assure you that I will try to bring out the many facets of your personality and also try to give everyone a sense of what are the factors that drove you, you know, during the years that you worked in the Foreign Service and beyond. I'd like to begin with the first question, which is Ambassador Rasgotra, who wrote the foreword to your book, said that diplomacy and history are integral to each other <coughs> and that a ringside seat to history is literally the prerogative of a diplomat's vocation. Of the many historic events you have personally witnessed or been involved in, can you tell us which two events have impressed or influenced the most, have influ influenced you the most? Yes, um, um, I'll give you two of them. One, which is the, the height, <laughs> at the highest level of inspiration, the other at the lowest level of repulsion. Uh, the uh, first and most memorable um, 
event which left a deep impression on me happened on the very first day I joined the Foreign Service. Um, we were invited uh, to meet uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, not as Prime Minister, but as Foreign Minister. Now he spoke to us, uh, each of us, there were 10 of us, the number one in the batch was a lady called Subjit Singh. She got, of course, a little more time than all of us. But he spoke to each of us in turn, um, asked us what we had studied, where we had studied, why we had joined the Foreign Service, etc. Then uh, when he finished with everyone, he said uh, two things. He said, my dear young friends, people will tell you diplomacy is all about going abroad to lie on behalf of your country. I want to assure you, India doesn't expect you to lie on its behalf. Never tell a lie. But remember, there is no pressing obligation to tell the truth. So uh, in some ways, <laughs> diplomacy is walking the, th the thin edge where um, you uh, never tell a lie, but quite often you are trying very hard to hide the truth. But now he had just said that, and it was a, a pleasant sort of moment. And suddenly the foreign secretary, Subimal Dutt, rushed into the room and whispered something in his ear. And then suddenly his mood changed. He was such, a, he was so relaxed. So we immediately knew it was something very important. So, uh, and then he asked, um, is it true? Has it been confirmed? Who has confirmed this? So um, then uh, he suddenly stops and he said, why are we speaking in whispers? These young people, these young officers will live with the consequences of today. What prophetic words and I have, you know, so for me, uh, the ringside seat of history began on the day I joined the service. And as we see, we are still, uh, you know, uh, handling the consequences of that day, 31st of March, 1959, when His Holiness the Dalai Lama crossed over into India. So for me, this really is the high point of, of, of my joining the Foreign Service. And I've constantly thought about all this. But the low point was when, um, uh, I was uh, High Commissioner to Ghana with concurrent accreditation to Liberia and uh, a coup took place there, uh, a dreadful coup, uh, uh, led in fact by the presidential bodyguard, the chief of the presidential bodyguard, where they rushed into the president's room, uh, they bayoneted him, uh, you know, apparently his intestine, intestines were all over the floor and it was a terrible sight. Then they took his body and they threw it into, uh, into some ditch there, dug, um, freshly dug ditch. But shortly thereafter, they arrested all the top um, uh, people, all the cabinet members, uh, the, 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 the Senate chief, the chief justice, everyone, and they had a, some sort of a, a, a court martial, a kangaroo trial. Then they took them all out, tied them to, to poles on a beach in Liberia, and they shot them. And sadly, uh, the, 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 the first volley missed the chief justice and missed the foreign minister. Uh, the, by the time the second volley was, uh, was fired, the chief justice had died, uh, died of a heart attack. And then the foreign minister, you know, got the second vote. And then uh, they made, um, uh, they took photographs of it and, you know, whoever took photos, they sold them to sort of calendar makers who then, you know, printed calendars um, in black and white for, um, for $5, colored for 10, showing these people before and after the execution. For me, this was really the, um, the, the lowest level of, of barbarity. And uh, sadly for me, I knew this uh, foreign minister, his name was Cecil Dennis. He was at that point, according to many, the most outstanding foreign minister in, um, in Africa. So both of these have left a very deep impression on me. Now, you know, uh, um, both are historic. The, the second one is, uh, we might find very repulsive and gruesome, but the fact is, it is history. And we are seeing, we as diplomats are seeing history in the making, both the good sides as also the terrible repulsive sides. Thank you, sir. That's a truly a very interesting choice, as you say, showing uh, how people can rise to the heights and inspire us, and also how barbarity can shock and depress us. 
Right. And we do see all these events as diplomats. Uh, my second question to you, sir, is in your book, there are several references to spiritual and miraculous happenings. Uh, I'm thinking in particular of the incidents in Myanmar and what you have called a miracle in New York. What effect did such events have on you, both as a diplomat and as a person? Yeah. <clears throat> The, uh, uh, what happened in, in Myanmar uh, was absolutely amazing. Uh, you know, we had a, a spacious uh, home in uh, Rangoon uh, and a lot of very stately trees. They were very nice in the summer, but uh, when in the rainy season, it was really very depressing because it was so dark outside and, uh, you know, uh, the, the big trees wouldn't allow the, the sunlight to, to, to come in. So I got, uh, I asked my Burmese gardener to, to chop off some of the branches and he made some excuse or the other not to, um, not to um, do what I told him. So I called, uh, I requested our uh, Tamil driver, his name was Manikam. I said, Manikam, uh, you know, these branches are quite low, you just bring a ladder and you do it. So he did this uh, within the next uh, day or two. Uh, thereafter, until then, Isabel was expecting our first baby, Premila, whom, whom you know so well, um, uh, was expecting her. And until then, she had kept uh, good health. Suddenly, her health began to deteriorate. You know, she began to get, um, uh, it was the, the uh, I later discovered the initial signs of eclampsia. And then she was taken to hospital and then it went from bad to worse. And later on, she uh, was told that she would have to undergo an emergency operation, the cesarean operation, three weeks before it was due. Then we went, um, uh, took her to hospital. Uh, we, we despaired both for the life of the, uh, of the mother and of the child. They survived, but uh, even after that, you know, she got a breast abscess and the child got, a, you know, a, an abscess, uh, uh, um, also a, a breast abscess on the, on, uh, on the left side. Uh, and uh, she had to undergo a surgery, uh, a premature child, four pounds and 10 ounces. Uh, it was the most dreadful sort of a thing you could imagine. Then when all this is happening, so, you know, our neighbor, uh, um, the British wife of a Burmese uh, naval commander had come to uh, see them in hospital. Then she drew me out and said, I want to tell you something. So I went down to her with the car. She said, Alan, all this is because you have chopped the branches of those trees. And she, was, and she said that I have lived in Rangoon long enough to know, uh, you know uh, the, the reality and uh, the veracity of all the world, what the Burmese believe. And she gave me amazing advice. A Roman Catholic, devout Roman Catholic, going to daily mass, <laughs> daily mass tells me that I should now offer, you know, um, uh, some um, sort of obeisance or um, like, like a donation to the tree spirits. It was two bottles of gin and four, and, uh, four cakes or something. And she said, you needn't do it. Uh, tell your um, Burmese gardener and he'll do it. So then I called, the, you know, I couldn't believe it. I, 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 to me, it was really like pagan advice, but I couldn't dare to take any more chances with the Isabel's help. So I told the uh, Burmese gardener to, to do this. And then he tells me, sir, it is because I, because I knew this was going to happen. I had not cut those trees, but I couldn't tell you that because you wouldn't believe me. And then he offered um, uh, this, uh, the, the two bottles of gin and the cake. And amazingly, the, Isabel's health began to improve. So from that day, for the rest of my life, I have always said that there is a, 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 a world you know, beyond um, our ken. So never disbelieve what other people believe, because you don't know. That's number one. That left a deep impression on me. Then uh, some years later, I think 12 or 14 years later, my, uh, when I was DGICCR, I had to rush to New York because we discovered that my son had uh, a malignant bone tumor in his, in his left knee. We went there. 
uh, fortunately, the Foreign Service came to my rescue because I couldn't have afforded this myself. They quickly found me, uh, the Foreign Secretary then Ramesh Bandari, quickly overnight within one day, he found me a post. He canceled someone else's posting and he posted me to Chicago. And Andy was admitted in Sloan Kettering in New York. Uh, the, the, he had the best doctors uh, who, uh, uh, who performed the surgery. And they told me, yes, it's been a very successful surgery. We have uh, removed everything, we have all the malignancy. But on the third or the fourth day, he developed a fever. It started uh, low, I don't know, um, 100 or something. But by that evening, it had reached 104. I was greatly concerned, you know, and so I um, went to see the doctor. Uh, and then I expected him to say, no, no, don't worry, it's okay. Uh, you know what, this always happens, and uh, but by tomorrow it'll be gone. Instead of that, he tells me, oh, I too am very concerned. Because this could be one of just one or two um, reasons. Either it could be an infection, which in a hospital like this, we don't think there's more than a 10% chance. It could be a flu, but there is no flu certainly in this part of town. Or number three, it could be the body rejecting the transplant, in which case we would have to amputate the leg. It was such a terrible news to me because we, we had flown all the way to New York to save Andy's leg and his life. Now both seem to be in, uh, you know, at risk. Now that evening, uh, that day, it was, um, I think the eve of Christmas, we had some volunteer who came into um, Andy's room distributing cakes because Andy was admitted in the, uh, in the children's section of the hospital. Uh, apparently up till 18, they put everyone there. And then he distributed these gifts. And then he told us that he was, um, he was a young uh, Jewish volunteer who had now converted to Christianity and was working in Mother Teresa's AIDS clinic. So when he said that, he said, I, I said, really, we are so happy to, to hear this. We are Catholics too. We are from India. And we knew Mother Teresa. In fact, I had helped in opening her, um, her center, uh, Mission to Charity Center in Lima, Peru, 12 years ago. So he said, really, well, something. And then he said that she was expected that evening on her way back from Caracas to, to Delhi. And um, if I meet her, I'll tell her, I'll tell her this, which he did. Now, amazingly, it was 12 years earlier, but Mother Teresa remembered us. She said, if it is uh, Mr. Nazareth, he's one of the few Catholics in the Foreign Service, I must go and see him. So she arrives in Sloan Kettering Hospital. Everyone is, <laughs> is absolutely astounded because she was by then, she had got, you know, the President's Medal of Honor the previous year. So everyone knew her. So they couldn't believe that she had come, you know, and the people at the reception then quickly call the director and the head nurse and everyone comes rushing down and they lead her to Andy's room. I was not there, sadly. I had gone home having spent the whole night there for a little rest and uh, for a shower. So apparently she comes into Andy's room. They are also astounded, Andy and Isabel. And then she prays over him and uh, makes him to recite a sh short prayer after her telling the baby Jesus, please, to, to, to cure him. And amazingly, this was in the morning. By, by that evening, by 9 o'clock, the fever begins to come down. And by the next morning, it is gone. And, um, uh, and uh, everyone is astounded, including, uh, including the, um, the surgeon. And then um, seven or eight days later, when he's discharged from hospital, when they do, you know, the pathological test, normally apparently there still are at least five or six percent of malignant cells. So they have to continue the chemotherapy for the, the next three or four months. In this case, they find a complete absence of malignant cells. And so the surgeon, I asked the surgeon, is this common? He said, no, I must confess, it's quite unusual. Now, this was 35 years ago, and the malignancy has never come back. This is the closest that I have come to a miracle <laughs> happening before my very eyes. So when she was being canonized, I wrote to the Pope, it was Pope John Paul, incidentally, whom we had met uh, in, uh, in Ghana. 
but uh, the reply I got didn't come from him, but from the papal nuncio in Delhi to say, well, thank you so much for bringing us for, to this notice, to our notice. But we are looking for miracles which occurred after her death rather than when she's alive. And I thought to myself, here is someone performing miracles while she's still alive. And they wanted to die before they will see, look for a lot of <laughs> miracle from her. But both these things have left a deep impression on my life that there are powers, uh, you know, um, great spiritual powers beyond our ken, uh, and that um, we should have deep faith in them. I believe deep faith in, in one and, and, uh, and no disbelief of the other. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, I want to move to another topic altogether. I read with fascination your account of the Dharampal Teja case. Uh, sorry, Dharam, Dharam Teja case. Uh, from his initial arrest in New York, his subsequent flight to Costa Rica, your follow-up actions when you were in Peru, his arrest again in the UK, and finally his extradition to India. I was particularly interested because, as you know, I've been involved in an extradition case of Abu <laughs> Salem from Portugal. Uh, how does a diplomat ensure that such efforts succeed? And how important is the role and cooperation of the host country? Yes, that is certainly the most uh, amazing, amazing assignment I've ever handled. And uh, it was quite ironic because I had met Teja at the height of his power. I've also written that in my book in Tokyo, when, uh, you know, every uh, sort of three months, a uh, bulk uh, carrier um, was being launched. Uh, and uh, for everyone, uh, you know, whom uh, he could, he would say that uh, I wonder whom I should call for my for for my next launch, and whoever he mentioned would come. And for, for uh, the, the last and the biggest one, one that he launched, uh, uh, Moraji Desai himself uh, came. He was then finance minister. Uh, so I see him at the height of his power. When I arrive in New York, the first sort of the day I arrived, the consul general gives me a file. There was only one CCB telegram in it to say that Dharam, uh, Dharma Teja has fled uh, uh, to whom the government of India had given a $40 million loan uh, for, you know, for his shipping uh, company, uh, has defrauded the company and, and fled. So we must try and find him. The last information that he was in New York, that was given to me. So uh, I then, uh, you know, made some inquiries, went and met the uh, director of um, immigration and uh, all the various people. We also sent out uh, notes to all the consulates in general to, to say that uh, yeah, there was someone who was fled from justice not to give him a visa. Uh, about one month went by and the Costa Rican consul general, uh, I was out for lunch, made some five telephone calls uh, to my secretary that he wanted to see uh, Teja, <laughs> wanted to see me about the Teja case. And then he came, uh, his name was Alfredo Lizano, and he kept on calling him Teja, Teja. Uh, initially I didn't know what he was talking about, but you know, later I, I discovered that all the Latins pronounced the J as an M, as an H. So uh, he said that uh, he is in Costa Rica. I found out that's the most amazing case because he belonged to a political family. Uh, the, his, uh, his aunt was married to the, to the president. Uh, and now uh, the man who had helped Teja to flee from, um, uh, who had uh, induced the consul general in New York to give a visa to uh, Dharma Teja in spite of our note was a former president called Figueres. Uh, to whom uh, we later learned uh, Teja had given $50,000. And since the man was fighting the next election, the $50,000, big amount in Costa Rica, particularly those days, you know, uh, was very crucial. So, uh, and Figueres belonged to the opposite political camp. So this consul general, he was not the consul, he was just a, he was just a consul, the, not the consul general, wanted now to expose Figueres and uh, the fact that he had been bribed. So, uh, I, so we asked him, I and the consul, what is your suggestion? He said that we must fly, <laughs> we must fly uh, to, uh, first to Mexico because um, a former president also related to him was ambassador of Costa Rica in Mexico. 
we I'll get a letter of introduction from him. With that, we will meet with the Costa Rican president. We never imagined that the government of India would ever permit. We have no um, we have no diplomatic relation with Costa Rica, uh, and this seemed like a wild goose chase. But amazingly, when we uh, referred this to <laughs> to them, within 24 hours they said Nazareth should go. So we we went. When we go to Mexico, we find uh, this uh, Mexico, uh, this Costa Rican ambassador in Mexico is in a hospital. He has just had a heart attack. So he said, "I." But he was recovering from that. He said, "I can't give you any letter in my present state, but I am willing to give." He just wrote, gave, gave his visiting card, on which he wrote, um, "You know, please receive these friends of mine." He had never met me before. So with that, we arrive in uh, in Costa Rica. In Costa Rica, this uh, this man says, uh, "We have arrived the previous day." Next morning, he says, "Let's go to the presidential palace," but he doesn't go through the front door. He takes us to uh, takes me to, through the kitchen door in the presidential palace early in the morning. The, pre the president's wife is, you know, sort of, you know, preparing his early morning coffee, and suddenly she finds uh, the two of us there. And then he tells him that we want to meet the president. She says, "You certainly can't meet him like that with a uh, with a foreigner with you." Then he show, uh, he gives her the the, the card uh, from the Mexican president. Uh, from the Mexican ambassador, uh, from, from the Costa Rican ambassador in Mexico. So she takes it to, uh, to the uh, her husband, and the husband then agrees to receive us. So we go, <laughs> we, we go and meet the president. He is in his dressing gown, reading the morning paper. So then uh, Lizano, the consul, tells me to tell him the, the whole case. I told him I should give him all the documents. He didn't say a word. He just called uh, the police chief and, uh, and said that, you know, uh, I don't know who let this man in. We have nothing to do with him. And obviously there is, a, you know, the US government is involved and so on and so on. Just have him sent out. So we almost succeeded. And uh, uh, the police said, yes, we will just tell the airline that brought him in just to take him back to where they brought him from. But by the time the police went to catch him, obviously someone had tipped him off. Maybe, maybe even in the in, in the police uh, department itself. So when they came to us here, suddenly disappeared, and then uh, you know and went, went into apparently hid in a in a, in a coffee estate. Uh, Figueres at that time is in Taiwan, so he comes back two weeks later and then makes a big sort of a public thing to say that Costa Rica has already been always been a land of liberty. We have given refuge to people fleeing you know, from injustice and oppression. Uh, and this man is a famous scientist you know, uh, being here, uh, and he's also a big ship owner. If Panama can do all that with shipping, why not Costa Rica? He will come here and you know we'll do this and we'll do that. Then, uh, <laughs> obviously, uh, the tables were turned on us. Now it became uh, you know, a, a big case. So they said, no, the least you can do is if the Indians want him, let them, uh, let them have an extradition, ask for extradition. Once we went into extradition, of course, it was going to be a long time. In the meantime, Figueres had been elected as president. And then uh, we obviously lost our case. Uh, and amazingly, the man who supported Teja uh, in the extradition case is a former chief justice of the Supreme Court, who is a great friend of Figueres. It is the most amazing story. We thought we had lost the case completely after that. Uh, and of course, uh, this man then got a diplomatic passport where he was on his way to, uh, to the UK. But and this is where the role of a diplomat comes. Um, um, when I was uh, on my first visit, uh, though we had no diplomatic, I asked to call on the uh, Secretary General in the Foreign Office, like a uh, Foreign Secretary. Um, and he received me. I couldn't believe this. And then he tells me, um, ambassador, normally I wouldn't, uh, 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 I was not ambassador then, uh, uh, Senor Nazare. Normally I wouldn't receive you because <laughs> uh, you have no appointment, uh, we have no diplomatic relation with India. Uh, I have received you only because you come from the land of Gandhi. And I have, I'm a great admirer of Gandhi. I couldn't believe it. It was Gandhi himself <laughs> working for me. So he received, then I told him this whole thing, and then he confessed that uh, it was a great embarrassment to us. We had received your note, we knew you had told us not to give him a visa. 
But, uh, you know, because uh, Figueres had spoken to our foreign minister, uh, he agreed, and so we are all sort of involved. That was, uh, you know, and that was the initial connection I had with him, and that friendship lasted. Now, when Teja, with his uh, diplomatic passport, was on his way, he was going first to Paris and to London. This foreign secretary, uh, his name was Alvar Antion, uh, had, because of the connection with me, uh, got a, a, a nephew of his who worked in a travel agency uh, to give him the entire travel schedule of Teja. He then calls me at his own cost from Costa Rica, um, San Jose, Costa Rica. I am in Lima as CDA to give me this whole information. That was so vital to us. So uh, I immediately conveyed this to, to Delhi and to CBI and everyone. And we decided that we wouldn't act on him in, uh, in, in Paris when he landed in Paris because we had no extradition treaty. But when he landed in London, <laughs> we were waiting for him. So he was arrested on arrival. The Costa Rican ambassador came and asked for diplomatic immunity and said he had a diplomatic passport and various things. The British said, the uh, diplomatic immunity applies only to those who are accredited in this country. He's not. So therefore, and uh, you know, we have a red alert from him from Interpol. Mm -hmm. So he's been arrested. So he was arrested in London. And then, you know, uh, the next edition case started there. Who do you think is, is representing him in London? Dinglefoot, the, the, <laughs> Lord Dinglefoot, the most uh, famous person. Uh, again, a hard fought battle, but he lost. Finally, he's brought to India first to Tihar jail, and then, to, uh, you know, in, uh, in, um, to, in Hyderabad. And amazingly, a friend of mine in Hyderabad, having read my book, just called me two days ago to say, you know, uh, I have met him. I said, how did you meet him? He said, uh, an aunt of mine was in hospital. When I went there, I found in the next room was Dharmateja. And he seemed so lonely, I felt the least I could do was to spend some time with him. And he was very <laughs> grateful to me. What a small word. But the fact that we succeeded till the end, the credit should go to this former foreign secretary, the, the Gandhian. So it is useful. Uh, it is useful to have the Gandhian connection, Lata. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I know that only too well. And uh, sir, we are running out of time and I need to pop move on to the other panelists. But I can't resist without asking you uh, you know, just one, one more question, yes. which is, uh, there is a view that access by diplomats to the top leaders in India was easier and more prevalent in the past. Do you think opportunities for this are less today? Well, um, I think it depends on two things. Number one, uh, of course, is it depends on, on the leader concern. Uh, and it also depends on uh, on the times uh, now with uh, you know so many more people and <laughs> so many more events taking place uh, i suppose there are less opportunities but uh, i must also say uh, uh, when i say it depends on the leader concern now for instance indira gandhi as dgiccr I was amazed at the sort of access that I had to her. I was only at the level of a joint secretary, mind you. But she was so keen on, uh, on culture. Now, I know, for instance, once we had, um, in knowing what her interest culture was, whenever we had someone of, uh, of importance, um, a poet, a writer, a sculptor, so and so, I would just send a note to the three or four different, the prime minister's office, the foreign minister's office, because he was the chairman of the ICCR, uh, to the Sangeet Natak Academy or whichever academy was concerned, and the minister of culture. You won't believe this, that um, uh, out of 10 times, uh, none of the others uh, have uh, <laughs> except a single one. But in um, uh, out of 10, I would say at least four times, Mrs. Gandhi would say, yes, I'll receive him. So it depends so much on the person concerned. And once there was someone who came from Ethiopia, a sculptor, 
he went and met her and she, you know, she would give 15 or 20 minutes. During that time, she refused to be disturbed by anyone else. I've seen chief ministers of states waiting outside to receive her and she's spending time with the Ito. When he came out, he burst out uh, weeping. He says, I can't believe that I, a humble sculptor, who have not been able to beat my own prime minister or president. I come to India and I've received the prime minister of India. That's wonderful, sir. You know, I mean, I think that shows you and uh, uh, the that you can indeed still get access to the top leadership. It depends on what the issues are and yes. uh, how yeah. how well you present your case. And that has been my experience throughout, I have to say. Uh, finally, sir, and I can't end without this. Uh, I'm sure many people are fascinated by the book by now, by hearing your stories. Uh, can I ask you, where is it possible to get a copy of this book? Well, it's available on Amazon.in. It's available on, uh, uh, on Flipkart in India. But I'm amazed that, that in London, besides being available on Amazon.com, it is available on, already in a number of the leading bookshops like Foils and, and others in London. So I, I never in my wildest dreams ever imagined that, that my book uh, would make me um, a sort of a worldwide celebrity if I may say. With, <laughs> with well, that's honest. a very, very wonderful note to end our discussion on, sir. I do have a few more questions, but depending on how many questions we get from the other participants in this call, if I get a chance, I will come back to them. In the meantime, may I turn the floor over to Ambassador Gurjeet Singh, my good friend, my colleague, and also your colleague and request him to shed some light on his impressions and what are the things he would like to discuss with you about your book. Gurjeet, the floor is yours. Thank you, Lata, and thank you for your very warm words and your very incisive questions, which elicits such wonderful replies from Sir Alan Nazare. Sir, and my first, my compliments on this book too. I mean, the your autobiography is so readable. It's great to go through it see how precisely you remember them. I wouldn't remember so many things. I'm probably 20 years younger than you. But you have a great sense of history yourself. So no wonder you have a ringside view. So my sincere compliments on a very readable book. Uh, I you, think book also brings out how humane the foreign service is and how we live with the travails which other people often can't understand. Nata has already spoken about, you know, your tryst with spiders. And I tell you, in many places, when you enter India house, you are well advised to make peace with the spirits of the house. I mean, we find it odd to say it because we are all rationals. But these are truths. Otherwise, they do things to you, which you have mentioned. But now, that apart. So... Having read your book, I realized that the only place where I had a common posting with you was in Japan. But your Japan was different. Your, you left Japan in 1963, whereas Japan bloomed in 1964 with the Olympics, with the Metro, I think, with more English being spoken and the Tokyo Expressway coming in. And most importantly, the Hindi movie Love in Tokyo came in 1964, opening new windows of Indians how to look at Japan. You, my impressions of Japan are very much based on my travels in my first posting and my encounters with Japanese food. You have spoken about how you learned Japanese and it reminded me when you talk about Kaki iro for orange, you know, and uh, sakura iro for pink, you know, colors drawn from nature. Kaki persimmon orange, sakura the cherry blossom pink, ao iro, you know, the blue, sora iro, what you call in your book, sora, the sky, that was blue. Very evocative of how you learned your Japanese. I must tell you, I had a much tougher time because I was expected to read the newspaper and translate it and tell everybody in the embassy what the newspaper says 
or if the news was coming on, I was expected to hear the news. So I think the Japanese we learned and the demands on us perhaps had changed by the time we came in. You know, sir, you mentioned some very interesting things about your Japan post. And I want to draw attention to how things have changed. You mentioned going in a cruise ship. My gosh, I had to wait till retirement to get into a cruise ship. Whereas in your case, you have so many, you know, anecdotes about how you traveled from place to place, including bringing in uh, Mrs. Nazareth to Japan. In our time, we were at the mercy of Air India. So by the time I joined service, a middle level colleague, slightly senior to me, told me a very wise thing. He said, avoid postings where Air India flies and there's a large Indian community. And so Japan fitted the second part. I mean, no large Indian community in those days, but Air India flew fairly frequently. And I soon realized the danger which he alerted me about. The danger was that large number of Indians with official connections would travel. And as a young third secretary, my weekend was spent looking after these people who were either not important enough to be received by the ambassador on a weekend, but important enough to impose on a third secretary's life. So I have a large number of people who intruded into my privacy, and I will never forget each one of them having done so. One of them actually came from Bangalore. And he, I was asked to look after him on a Sunday. And I had an irate wife on my hands. So we decided to go to the Ginza, which was our plan, and take him along. But he was very unhappy with me for taking him to the Ginza because he said he wants to see the rural people of Japan. So I thought quickly and I pointed to everybody walking on the Ginza. You know, on Sundays, Ginza was a walking people's heaven. So and I said, you know, all these are rural people because on Sundays, all the city people go to the countryside and all the country bumpkins come here. So all these are rural people. You want to talk to any of them? I'll be happy to interpret for you. He was quite taken aback that the rural people would actually dress in nice jeans and t-shirts and come to the Ginza. So it was, it was what, you know, uh, what you said, you know, the lying for your country. You know, that story which you have. Uh, but here it was a half-truth for my country. So I think <laughs> I learned to do these half-truths very often. So in my memory, Japan was food, sumo, Netaji, all these things which had become contemporary. You talk a lot about shipping and you link it to Jayanti Dharamteja. Shipping was a big thing. But in my first assignment in Japan, it was the time that we brought Maruti into India. And my second assignment in Japan came with liberalization. So it was a trading relationship converting to an investment relationship and the technology collaborations over the years. So it was like a continuum from what you witnessed to what I was a part of. So in your book, I hear about the India house, which you mentioned, but you don't say anything about our embassy, which was actually, if I remember right, on a very beautiful Sakura lined uh, avenue near the Yasukuni Jinja. And I think to me, my indelible memory of Tokyo always will be this great embassy from where from our windows, we could see the blooming Sakura, the cherry blossoms. Another interesting thing which you mentioned is about the Indians. And you mentioned it out of Rangoon. You know how you help the Indians when they had a lot of problems in Rangoon. I think this was the issue that we were all slowly learning to in, uh, adjust to by the time I came to the foreign service, that the Indians were important assets for us and we need to relate to them. And that is what I think we learned in Japan. And uh, But 
the Indians had their own demands. And you had to meet them and then see what to do. And I think this is a lesson that I learned early on in Japan and I carried through the rest of my career. You don't mention much about your language policy except to say your lessons, but I'm sure you had interesting, embarrassing moments with Japanese over there. So would you like to tell us some interesting moment where you said something inadequate or inappropriate line of your Japanese learning. Yes, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to tell you one such um, instance. Uh, I had been in Tokyo for maybe just three or four months. Uh, and I was just beginning to learn <laughs> uh, my Japanese language, you know, colors and all that you mentioned. When the ambassador suddenly, ambassador secretary suddenly calls me one morning to say that there is a um, a textile and international textile exhibition or costumes exhibition or something opening in the Takashimaya department store. It is being opened by Princess Chichibu. The ambassador was supposed to go, but now he has suddenly been gone to the foreign office. So he wants you to go. I couldn't believe it. I said, why, you know, what about senior officers? I'm the junior boss. The Princess the Chichibu is coming. Obviously, I'm not the right child. They said, no, no, the, all the others are, uh, have been asked and they're not available. And I said, I have no transport. They said, no, no, it's okay. They, they, uh, we'll give you uh, the staff car. Uh, great big, they look like a battleship, but you know, as far as I was concerned, those days uh, um, I had a very, the smallest of uh, four tonnes, but I had no choice. So I arrived over there. When I arrived there, the, all the red carpet and the, my door is opened, I get up trembling and I'm walking towards the plate. It is one man bows down very deeply and says, Hajime Nakamura. So I said, sir, I'm sorry, I just arrived four months ago. I don't, I'm just learning Japanese. I don't understand Japanese. And so uh, again, he bent down and said, Hajime Nakamura. Um, and then um, again, I, I you know, try to explain to him. Then he tells me in perfect English, I understood you the first time. I was I was greeting you, welcoming you, and telling you my name. Hajime Nakamura is my name. <laughs> so he was not saying anything to me except just telling me his name. And I felt so foolish, really. I mean, this was my first great diplomatic uh, sort of blunder, if I may say. But I, I couldn't I couldn't help it. So we we do go through things now and again, but. Um, um, uh, the other time, if I may talk about Japanese, I've mentioned this in my book. But incidentally, in my book, I have mentioned about the uh, about the, the chancery, maybe I've referred to it, uh, that it was uh, on the imperial moat, uh, you know, uh, fairly close to the British government. And, uh, and really, I think it's the best location and the most prestigious location in Japan, uh, with the uh, imperial palace in the front and the Yashkuni Jinja, <laughs> uh, you know, almost uh, next to it. But the other embarrassing moment where I was saved by the skin of my teeth was, uh, as far as Japanese is concerned, was in uh, Tokyo. Princess, um, uh, Prince Akihito and Michiko went to India, uh, I think, uh, in, uh, you know, the year after wow. I arrived. I was, in, I was a visa officer. So I, in fact, signed their visas. I have the <laughs> great uh, honor of signing them. When they came back, and it was a wonderful visit in India, they were uh, received uh, uh, very warmly. Uh, and I think this was the first visit from a member of the Imperial household to, to India. Now, when they came back, the chancellor, the Imperial chancellor asked to call on the embassy, uh, to, to the ambassador. Saying that uh, he had a gift from Princess, uh, from Prince Akito in Michiko for him. So all of us were sort of uh, summoned to be in the ambassador's office when he arrived. And he brought a beautiful picture in a silver frame with um, the chrysanthemum crest on the top uh, and uh, then presented to the ambassador. And this was autographed. The ambassador suddenly turns to me and said, Oh, Alan, you are a Japanese officer. Can you tell me which is uh, uh, the prince's signature and which is the princess's? Now, it, you know, it, even for someone who knows Japanese very well, just to uh, read and recognize signatures is not very easy. My God, I was really stunned and terrified. The only one alphabet <laughs> that I could recognize was the one for Ko. 
And you know, quick thinking told me that uh, Michiko, uh, sorry, Ko uh, is there only in Michiko, not in Akihito. So I said, this is uh, the, the princess and this is the princess. And everyone said, including Lord Chancellor, my God, I must say, he can recognize, even Japanese find it very difficult to read signatures. What a brilliant officer you have. But I had been saved by the skin of my teeth. <laughs> Well, sir, if I could interject here, because we are running a little behind uh, time. Uh, thank you so much, Gurjeet. You brought out some fascinating aspects of uh, your common experiences in uh, Japan. So may I now turn to Professor Gita Dharampal. Uh, Gita, the floor is yours. Um, well, it's a real pleasure to be participating in this webinar book discussion on uh, Ambassador Nazareth's book. And um, being a historian, I feel a little out of place in this um, eminent, uh, on this eminent panel, but I will try and um, give a perspective on the book from my historian's perspective. So, and um, since the time is short, I will just read out what I have um, scripted um, so that I can mention everything that I think is perhaps uh, interesting for the audience too. Um, and my, um, my connection is not too good. So I'll just go on, um, uh, I'll be um, not visual, visually uh, available, but you can hear my voice. And I think that is perhaps the best, uh, more important. So uh, Ambassador Nazareth's riveting narrative, extending over three and a half decades and spanning five continents, Asia, Africa, North and South America, and Europe, presents the reader with a tour d'horizon, amazingly dynamic and deeply insightful, of the tumultuous events unfolding in the global arena from the late 1950s to the mid 1930s, uh, 1990s, against the backdrop and often entangled uh, with the Cold War, the Cuban Revolution, the uprising in Tibet against China, which led to the exile of the Dalai Lama, about which you have heard, um, but also in the shadows of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Vietnam War, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the Civil Rights Movement, the assassin ass assassination of Martin Luther King, followed by that of Robert Kennedy, and exhilarated by the landing of the first man on the moon, as well as the dramatic process of decolonization, punctuated by three coups in Western Africa. And last but not least, the dissolution of the Soviet Union and its far-reaching repercussions. Exercising the craft of diplomacy in masterly fashion, representing India as a cultural superpower, Pascal Alan Nazareth as a man of all seasons at home in the world, accompanied by his stunningly beautiful and empathetic wife, Isobel, bears bountiful te testimony to India's ancient motto, Udara Charitanam Tu Vasudeva Kutumbakam, for the enlightened, all of humanity is one family. And what's more, his amazing autobiography that narrates facts which are stranger than fiction, his stupendous narrative, truthful, forthright, but without malice to anyone, always remaining transparent and supported by credible circumstantial evidence, Nazareth's incredible life story doesn't end with his last posting as Indian ambassador to Mexico, but has an even more impressive sequel um, for after furthering India's interests, both political and economic, as well as enhancing her cultural standing in the world, on retiring from the diplomatic service, Alan Nazareth dedicated his life to evangelizing or spreading the gospel of India's civilizational moral values and humanitarian precepts by focusing on the extraordinary personality of Mahatma Gandhi. And it was in this connection that I had the privilege to become acquainted with our ambassador personally. 
namely by hosting at the South Asia Institute, Heidelberg University, a book launch for the German translation of his first book entitled Gandhi's Outstanding Leadership in October 2016. And in view of our Gandhi 150 celebrations, but not to belabor this topic, let me just say a few words about his special book, translated into 12 Indian languages and 23 global ones. And this is the reason why it was translated so often. Setting aside the stereotypical image of Gandhi as a saint, visualizing an elusive utopia, Mr. Nazareth judiciously projects him as a man who strove in the real world, full of tensions and contradictions, to achieve an astounding correspondence between thought and action, to practice what he preached, and this against all odds. In the process, during the course of his life, Nazareth traces Gandhi, uh, uh, traces how Gandhi effectuated the feat of negotiating a number of divergent roles, namely as a creative thinker, a political leader, a social reformer, all the while being a deeply religious person. Indeed, a rare combination of functions which Gandhi exercised with utmost integrity and commitment. In short, rather than treat Gandhi as an ivory tower idealist, Mr. Nazareth has succeeded in depicting him as a man of action and as one of the most successful hands-on political leaders of the 20th century. But now to conclude, let me say a few personal words about our eminent ambassador and author whom we are celebrating today. Since a ringside seat to history is an amazing autobiography, it certainly reveals quite a lot about the character traits of the man who penned its pages. And first and foremost, his date of birth on the 7th of April, 1936 is revealed, from which the following can be deduced. Being born under the zodiac sign of Aries, Alan's personality is characterized by creativity, ambition, and vigor. And his mind is one of the, his greatest assets. And knowing this, he uses his intellect to display creativity and charm at any given moment in different global constellations as testified in his autobiographical narrative. This quality has earned him many friends throughout his life but it is his ambition and vigor that people most admire. If there is a goal he wishes to achieve, he does all in his power to achieve it. And this drive, despite great personal tragedies, is the secret of his successful and enriching life together with Isobel, with whom he'll soon be celebrating their diamond wedding anniversary. May the happy couple be blessed and continue to enthrall all who have the privilege to know and treasure their friendship. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Geeta. That was a really outstanding tribute to Ambassador Alan Nazareth, if I may speak on his behalf. Uh, if I could just ask one short question. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, I wanted to know, um, to what extent your three and a half decades long diplomatic career transformed and shaped your persona, your personal identity? Please tell us or indicate in a few brush strokes how your personality was molded and enriched from the time of your birth on the 7th of April, 1936, to the time when you began writing your autobiography on the 7th of April, 2016, 80 years later to the day. Could you describe this development as a kind of sublimation of your persona? Yes, I would think so. Uh, throughout my life, uh, two things my father had told me I always carried with me. 
he had told me, you know, when I, my first attempt at the foreign service failed and I was so, so disappointed. He said, Alan, we see only up to the horizon. God can see beyond. I'm sure next year he'll have something better for you. Mm. And you know, that year, if I have, if you don't get the foreign service, I yes, you can get uh, any one of the services down the line, a postal service or something. If I got it, I'm sure I would have taken it rather than go through the whole, uh, you know, uh, torture of doing the whole exam again. Fortunately, I didn't get anything the first year. I did it the next year and I got the foreign service. So how right he was that we can look only up to the horizon, God can look beyond. I've always carried this through my uh, career and through all my life. And this, I believe, what has really given me is such mm. a lot of equan equanimity. The other thing he told me, which stood me in very good stead in the senior levels of the service, he said, Alan, remember, you know, he had spent many years uh, in the judicial service. He retired as a district judge. When I was leaving, he told me, Alan, I don't, I want your only ambition to be to do whatever job is given to you, the best that it has ever been done. Mm -hmm. Do your best to do it better than it has ever been done. That should be your only ambition because in the higher levels of the service, please remember it is not your technical competence, but your political acceptability, which will come into play. Mm -hmm. And I saw this happen in my case, you know, at the senior level, I was the senior most officer knowing Japanese, I should have gone uh, to Japan, instead of that they sent me to Mexico. And I knew uh, it was a political decision, but <laughs> it didn't, uh, I was certainly very disappointed, but it didn't um, depress me. I said, well, uh, I'll do whatever I can in Mexico so that I will do it better than it has ever been done before. And in fact, in fact, uh, when I was leaving, one of the tributes um, paid to me was that Mexicans have always sort of thought of India as that mysterious land where the beauty of the Taj Mahal, the spirituality and, you know, and the extreme poverty are all sort of combined together in some mysterious sort of combination uh, and um, uh, incredible combination. No one ever imagined India as a partner for investment and trade and you know various things. Not at, le at least not until Alan Nazareth came to town. So when I left, <laughs> I was happy to see that a lot had changed in Mexico and I had left an impact, um, you know, there. So the, uh, a good proof of that is, would you know that a review of my book has come out they, two reviews of my book have come out in Mexico okay. recently. Paying, <laughs> paying me great compliment to say that this ambassador had nothing really to start with except the cultural connection. And he used the cultural connection in order to, <laughs> in order to open up a whole lot of doors. No one imagined we would set up a cultural center in, um, in Mexico. I opened mm -hmm. one. And the, uh, the, 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 the head of the culture, the chairman, was a former president, Miguel de la Madrid. We had a Nobel, uh, Nobel uh, laureate, Octavio Paz, on it. Mm -hmm. so, so using the, uh, the, the uh, cultural connection, I managed to uh, you know, establish contacts with the most important people in the land. And then, through that, other doors got open. In, in the field of industry, investment, so and so, so and I had many friends in New York. So I got all of them, all of them to come. Uh, um, you know, uh, people on the handicraft side, uh, the State Bank of India, Air India, everyone came in. So I believe in all this. Uh, one needs to use uh, a little bit of imagination and culture. Mm -hmm. I want to to say culture in our service. I think for a long time has been given a rather low priority. When I was appointed as DGI CCR, people said, you are not going to accept it. That is meant for the ladies, not for you. <laughs> because my predecessors uh, were women. And I myself uh, didn't want to accept it after all I heard. So I went to uh, Raskotra, uh, Farun said Raskotra to complain. He said, uh, he and I, he, he was my mentor. He said, Alan, he asked me a simple question. If I was bad for you, would I have sent you there? And then he told me, Mrs. Gandhi has told me that we must do something with the ICCR. 
as of now, it's a very sleepy sort of a mm. post. Uh, and they are only sending uh, cultural troops to, uh, you know, um, um, uh, to cater to uh, the cultural needs of NRI communities in Fiji and the Caribbean. And he said, no, I want this to make it a two-way trade. I want someone who knows something also about Western culture so that we can bring the best of the West to India, best of the world to India, and send the best of India to the world. It's after he told me that, then I suddenly saw what was the importance of this. And he was the one who told me, Alan, please keep in mind, when it comes to culture, India is the superpower. Mm. And that I have carried with me right through. I'm sure uh, Lata will agree with me on that. Yes, I do, sir. Thank you so much. Thank but, you but again. One moment, Gita um, and, uh, uh, and um, Gurjeet, I want to thank you both so much uh, for uh, all mm. that, the kind thank words you. you said about me. I love you much more than before now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we all love you, sir. And, you. and now if I can move to the, you know, your book is beautifully illustrated, sir. Okay. And we have chosen three illustrations, which we are going to project. So could I please request BIC to put those slides up on the screen? Because, and then perhaps we could talk very briefly about each one. This is the signing of the Indo-US Joint Commission on economic, commercial, science, technology, education, and cultural cooperation in 1974 between Secretary of State Kissinger and Foreign Minister Y.B. Chavan. Uh, why was this such a significant uh, event that you chose this photograph, sir? Well, um, uh, it's an important photograph because this opened up a whole lot of new doors with this, uh, with this uh, agreement that was signed. But uh, it's also got uh, two interesting stories which I would like to recount. Uh, it, uh, you know, everything was laid out. Um, I was put in charge. I, I don't know why I was only a director in charge of the economic division those days. Uh, maybe it should have been given to the, it, it was a scientific, could have been given to the, uh, sci uh, the Ministry of Scientific Research or Department of Scientific Research or the Department of Culture. However, everything was laid out and all the agreements were, were made in English and uh, Hindi version. Uh, when, uh, you know, when you sign these agreements, uh, the, uh, our Indian, uh, the Indian side, uh, um, uh, Foreign Minister Y.B. Chavan signed the Hindi version first, and then he gives the Hindi version, uh, Kissinger signs the English version, and then uh, you know, the two are exchanged. Now, everything is laid out, uh, and uh, this uh, the, uh, uh, very uh, handsome silver pot with a pen. Uh, um, Y.B. Chavan picks his pen to sign the agreement, and then discovers that uh, there is no ink in the ink pot. And then he turns to me and says, so uh, what could I do with the crisis? The only thing I could do was to pull um, the, the Parker pen from my pocket and give it to him. So this important agreement has been signed with my pen, number one. Number two is then he has signed this, then the Hindi version is given to Kissinger. Kissinger then says, oh, Mr. Foreign Minister, I can't sign this agreement. I can't read a word of it. Now, why Bichavan has not been considered one of our smartest sort of foreign ministers, certainly not as far as the party is concerned. And then he comes out with this amazing thing. He said, Mr. For, um, Secretary of State, recently you were in Beijing and signed a whole lot of agreements. I'm sure you couldn't read a word of those. If you can sign that, those, you can certainly sign these. These are quite innocuous compared to them. Everyone burst out laughing, including, uh, you know, Ambassador Moinihan standing behind, everyone. And if you, if you notice, he still has a smile on his face. Even he could not resist a smile, Kissinger. And yeah. then, then, then he smiled. <laughs> so that well, is an and that's a fascinating thing. story. I will so. never forget that, yes. Thank you. Can we move to the next slide, please? Now, this is a very interesting uh, slide because I see that four people are sitting on the ground. This was a reception at uh, the High Commissioner's residence in Kensington Palace in London in honor of Prime Minister Moraji Desai in 1977. Uh, and there were three former prime ministers of the UK present, as you've told me. Uh, why, why this particular juxtaposition with some people on the floor? I think that's an interesting story. Yes, this of all my the photos is the most stunning of them all, I must say, because there are 
four, uh, three former British prime ministers. Uh, here at the extreme left is Michael Foote, the leader of the opposition. And here is Lord Mountbatten sitting on the floor. Now, all of us were standing. Uh, just before the photo was taken, Lord Mountbatten suddenly says, my God, I'm hiding the prime minister. He is the VIP, not me. And then he goes on his ground and I, I'm really, uh, all of us were standing. He was able to sit so comfortably on the cross-legged on the floor. Now, when he goes on the floor, <laughs> obviously uh, uh, the high commissioner had to go on the floor. Uh, foreign secretary had to go on the floor. Poor Mrs. Nehru there is just crouching. She can't go on the floor herself. Now, I, I, I was standing there. In fact, all these people were standing in the front line. I was on the back line. By the time I want to go down, because it's so amazing and absurd that I should be standing when all of them are sitting. But by the time I had no place to sit. And in the meantime, the photo, photograph was taken. So even today, I'm embarrassed that I am the one standing there, least significant of all these people, a non-entity. And these others are sitting on the ground and you know, behind. But it is really the most amazing and stunning photo I've got. And everyone who has seen it thinks it, <laughs> thinks it is so. Yes, sir. Can we see the next photo, please? Uh, sir, yeah. this is, of course, at Sun House, which was your residence when you were DHC in uh, London. And I recognize Zubin Mehta and Nancy Mehta. Uh, and in 1978, I believe. No, uh, it's I 19, think, December of 1977. I see, because in the book it says 1978. Yeah, maybe that is a mistake. Yeah, uh, but uh, why was this such a significant event? Well, um, uh, it was the day after Christmas. I suddenly get a call at the telephone. Uh, I say, this is Zubin. Uh, I, I was done. I said, Zubin, Zubin Mehta. He said, yes, yes, I'm calling to invite you and your wife. To, um, uh, to the opera I'm conducting tomorrow, um, Richard Strauss's Salome. Uh, and then since it's always been my custom to include the head of the mission, and I made inquiries, I was told the High Commission is away and you are ex as, uh, acting High Commission. So I'm calling you. Uh, will you accept? I said, of course I'll accept. So uh, Isabel and I went there and we were received uh, really with such grace and honor. His secretary received us uh, at the entrance and then took us to his box and we had a ringside view of the whole event. At the end of the opera, the secretary comes to escort us, you know, backstage to sip champagne with uh, all the others and to meet all the lead singers there. And that's the first time I was meeting him and seeing the close rapport that he has with all his musicians and with the opera singers. It was such a pleasant evening. When I was leaving, uh, just before leaving, I asked him very timidly, uh, Zubin, you've done us such a great honor. The least I could do uh, is to uh, arrange a reception in your honor. Would you accept? He immediately says, yes, will you give me samosas and green chilies? I thought he was joking about the green chili. Um, so uh, he said, I said, yes, yes, I'll give you whatever you want. So they came, uh, you know, this was on the 29th of December, uh, the day after their last uh, performance. They came to, uh, this is our uh, home, um, uh, our sitting room in Sun House. And it was such an amazing evening. Uh, now, uh, four of the lead singers, the two uh, main uh, female singers, uh, uh, here uh, on the extreme left, uh, is uh, Barbara Daniel. She was the Salome in the in the in the, in the opera. Uh, uh, this is uh, Hildegard, uh, the, the one next to uh, Nancy Mehta, or, uh, or to my left is um, Hildegard uh, Behrens. Behind that is uh, Robert Cassidy, and there is uh, Benjamin Luxon um, uh, uh, hidden somewhere behind. And then we had uh, a whole lot of uh, VIPs along uh, along with this. There was uh, Lord Paul Gorbut, a uh, former ambassador to India. There was Evan Luard, who was the Secretary for Commonwealth Affairs. There was the, the chairman of the British Arts Council. There was the director of the, um, uh, of the Royal Opera House uh, and uh, you know, music and critics of uh, all the lead, lead papers. So it is a, uh, an event which I will never forget and I treasure. And if you look at this photo, it has been autographed by him and he has written happy memories. It's certainly a very, very happy <laughs> memory for me. And this made it a, a, a lifelong friendship, really.
that I, if I may go a little further beyond this photo, when they came to India for the, uh, you know, for their performance, their tour of, of India in 1984, to a packed audience in uh, in Delhi at the end of the conference, all, all the ICCR staff came and garlanded all the other 179 musicians. For Zubin, uh, there was one special one who had been selected, and that was Isabel. So Isabel came on stage with a, a garland of 100 red roses. It was pretty heavy, and they put it around him. Now, when she was doing so, he recognized her. And then in the middle, in the, in the, in the, I mean, in the presence of almost 1,200 people in City Foot Auditorium, PM, we, a vice president, everyone sitting there, he puts his arm around, around her on stage and gives her a big hug, then holds her hand and makes her and him to bow to the audience together. I, I have a, a video of that. And then I was sitting just behind uh, Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, and she turns around and said, um, Alan, um, Isabel must be the most envied woman in the country today. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, I'll always remember that remark because sadly, within the next, uh, I don't know, two or three weeks, she was assassinated. Yes, that was a great tragedy. Uh, Pratiti, I'm so sorry we've cut into the time for the questions and answers, but these stories were so fascinating, I really couldn't cut them short. Uh, would you like to take over and uh, ask any questions that have come in? Yes, uh, yeah. Um, so there have been several um, comments and questions from uh, K. Jai Raj. Uh, Ambassador Lata Reddy was outstanding and uh, brought out the best from Mr. Nazareth. This was a spellbinding dialogue and congratulations to BIC. Okay. Uh, Mr. Nazareth is humility personified and a man with a great heart. Um, Thank uh, you. <laughs> Rishi Atreya has a comment and a question. Amazing incidents of the power of faith. And then uh, the question is, what is the role of think tanks in governance and diplomacy? Why are there such few think tanks outside New Delhi? Sir, would you like to answer? Yes, uh, I don't know. I must confess uh, too much about these, the, these things, the think tanks. And since uh, most of them are financed by some industrial group or the other, uh, though I have a great respect for, um, for all the people involved with them, many of them are very, very respected intellectuals. Uh, I'm always <laughs> a bit suspicious uh, about uh, what they are trying to, to project. Like our own newspapers, for instance, each of them have got an editorial policy of their own. So uh, I prefer to, uh, to, to deal with people outside the think tanks, uh, think on a personal, a personal basis, or best of all, just to read their books rather than read their reports out of think tanks. Thank you. Um Siddharth Raja has a comment and a question. Uh, his comment, good, better, best, never let it rest until your good is better and your better best. How I remember our Jesuit fathers instilling this thought in us students. Thank you, sir, for your thoughts and insights. A privilege to listen to you. Um, and his question is, it's about the Liberia coup. Uh, I take it uh, the story you were referring to was of Samuel Doe yes. and uh, Doe's own sorry similar end 10 years later. Uh, what shadow did the Cold War cast over African nations like Liberia during that era, especially on how such African governments came and went, sometimes supported by the Soviets or the USA? Um, I would love to hear Ambassador Najrit's ringside view of this. Yeah. Well, uh, Liberia is only one of the many instances where there is, uh, you know, uh, outside powers at play. It's most um, evident of all in Latin America. Before I went to Latin America, I, I was thinking to myself, oh, these poor Latins, uh, you know, in 200 years of history, some of them have had 150 government. And I put all the blame uh, on the Latins. It's only after I went to Latin America, I discovered in almost every coup, there has been someone who has pulled the strings, you know, and done all sorts of things, economic destabilization, uh, you know, assassinations, 
all things. And uh, the best example is Chile uh, under Allende. But in Liberia, uh, amazingly, you know, this was something that I researched about. Um, uh, to, about Liberia, you have to keep in mind the, uh, the terrible history of Liberia, which is not uh, very well known. And when you see all the brutalities, uh, you will not understand them unless you know what is the past of Liberia's history. Now, the Liberians who came um, after the Civil War, many of them were encouraged to, to leave and go to Liberia. Uh, because I don't know, there was some connection between the US and Liberia. And like a lot of English people, uh, or the poorer English people were encouraged to go to Australia and sort of paid their passage. The same thing was done to these people. So a lot of the uh, liberated blacks, former slaves came to Liberia. But having come to Liberia, they became the new elite and treated local Liberians, uh, you know, as black as them, uh, you know, like slaves. And this went on for um, more than 100 years. Now, when this uh, outbreak took part, it was all that pent up hatred for that, all those years that, uh, that took place. And that is why that coup, coup was so brutal. Also, um, uh, you lay, uh, you, as you later learned from the, bio, from the biography or the autobiography of Mrs. Talbot, who was there in the bedroom when they, you know, uh, bayoneted her husband, she has revealed that the person who actually put the, uh, the, the first bayonet into her husband, uh, the masked face, was a white face. And one of the coasters, many years later, he had uh, you know, fled the country and he was uh, in, Sw in Sweden, revealed, in fact, that this was a CIA man. And the CIA had given the entire map uh, of the presidential palace. Otherwise, you know, there, there are so many ways you can't get to a presidential bedroom <laughs> that easily. They had provided the, the map to the, to the whole thing. So uh, this is the, uh, the, the clearest example. And then, of course, after the, uh, after the coup takes place, uh, Liberia, which until then, uh, you know, had fairly, uh, I wouldn't say close relations, but had good relations with the Soviet Union. All of a sudden, it changed, and now they became very friendly with the, with the, with the, with the US. And then, you know, American VIPs began to come in, et cetera. So it's really a gruesome story, and uh, the way it played out. Uh, but, uh, Samuel Doe and his people were very, very brutal with all the others, but he got it back because once he uh, became president, he, uh, um, he was an ordinary corporal, <laughs> like Napoleon, but, but far less, uh, but, uh, far less um, uh, what I say, wise and certainly far, far cruder. Uh, so um, he had now, um, you know, got himself to be president, and then he was having a meeting with um, uh, one of these ECOMOG. There was civil war, so there was a military observation group from the UN, and he was having a meeting with them. When suddenly, uh, you know, uh, one of the uh, guerrillas in the mountains belonging to the opposite camp, who were uh, from the elite group. So they had now, they, are, um, uh, they paid back uh, to uh, Samuel Doe what he had done to their people. And that is why they um, tortured him. Uh, and mind you, all this now is videotaped. They tortured him, they cut his ears off, they cut his legs off and finally beheaded him. And then, you know, hung his uh, beheaded body in the, in, the, in the main square of Liberia. Really gruesome things that uh, you could never imagine have happened. And I have been fairly, I wouldn't say I've actually watched it happen personally, but it was all videotape. So I've seen this with my own eyes. And, and greater uh, brutalities and, um, and uh, more repulsive acts is difficult to imagine. But there is a lot of hatred. There was a lot of hatred among these two class of Liberians, the original Liberians, the indigenous Liberian, and those who had come from abroad, who had become the Liberian elite. But now there have been so many changes there since I left. But the amazing thing there, if I may say, is that when all those people, uh, you know, in Talbert's cabinet were taken out and shot, only one uh, among the four people who had been left was the uh, was uh, a lady called uh, Johnson um, Sidleaf, uh, who 
was present at my presentation of credentials and I knew her. So she fled the country, went to the US and stayed there for, I don't know, 20 years. And then I think she got a job uh, in Antad or something and got posted um, to, uh, to Nairobi for some years. But in 2005, she came back there, uh, the civil war going on, etc. She ran for elections, lost in the first bit. In the second one, she won. Now she's president of Liberia and won a Nobel uh, Prize because uh, of her very statesmanlike approach. She managed to end the civil war, uh, appointed a number of women to the cabinet for the first time, uh, and uh, really brought about uh, a healing touch uh, there, like uh, Nelson Mandela had done. In fact, she set up a Truth and Reconciliation Committee. So uh, she's one of the women I greatly admire, yes. I admire a lot of women, including all the ones uh, on, on, the, on this panel. <laughs> and Lata. Thank you. <laughs> uh, th thank you. We, we are amazed by your powers of recall. Um, you know, all these names and places from so many years ago. Um, thank you for that history lesson on Liberia. Um, well, one more question from Raj Nandini Shaw. How do you see the future of Indian diplomacy and world literature in India? <laughs> It's yeah. a very broad question. I, uh, I better not say anything about the future of Indian diplomacy because uh, a lot of junior colleagues always think that, you know, these old fogies are retired and they think that everything was hunky-dory when they were there and now that they are retired, they think that we are going down the drain. Uh, the thing I would say is that uh, uh, Indian diplomacy has far more challenges today than uh, they, they were, uh, you know, years ago. The world is a far more dangerous place now uh, than it was during, during my time. I've done a lot of travels uh, since I retired, mainly because of my books. But just since I retired, uh, and also my cruises, I've done 35 cruises. I've traveled all over the world. And in all these places, I've called on the heads of missions concerned. And there I have met a number of, uh, never mind the senior officers, but younger officers. And I must say, I'm so deeply impressed with these officers. They are certainly far better informed than us and really so dedicated, you know? And um, uh, I try to reach out to them. I try to stay in touch with them. I'm uh, the IFS Google group. Uh, whatever I post, I really have them, uh, them in mind so that what little experience or wisdom <laughs> we might have acquired you know, we could share with them. And I'm ha so happy to say there is so much of appreciation from them, which encourages me, which encourages me greatly. There is no doubt at all about their competence and about their, um, um, their dedication and their, and their loyalty to India. Um, you know, ultimately, their diplomat is like a lawyer holding a brief. It all depends on what brief you give him. Now, uh, one of the things if I mention is, some of them have told me their frustration. Gandhi is the greatest soft power asset we have. But of late, they have been trying to promote some others, completely unknown, you know, um, some of the ideologues of the, on the other side. Uh, sadly, in India today, uh, Gandhi has become the Desh Drohi, and his assassin has become uh, the, 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 the Desh Veer, the national hero. Now, uh, it's a, it's a strange sort of a thing, uh, which well, I'm, um, I'm sure will not go in the world. And if you are trying to promote people on the other side, uh, particularly the ideologues, have, uh, some books have been published. One of them I'm amazed by the Ministry of External Affairs, which has never in the past ever published anything, uh, you know, political belonging to one party or the other. Gandhi is the father of the nation. Now, uh, they have to, told me, it is so difficult to promote something when there are no takers. You, I, we organize something for Gandhi, there's no problem getting, uh, you know, at least 300 people. Now you uh, organize something and, you know, five or 10 or 15 people arrive, obviously it's a great embarrassment. So that is sort of some of the challenges I think, uh, you know, some of them are facing today and I sympathize with you. Um. I think we're out of time, but if any of you have a burning question, uh, Ambassador Reddy, Professor Dharampal. May I? 
Yes, go ahead. Yes. I, I just wanted to say, Ambassador, I don't know whether you realize it, Ambassador Nazareth, but uh, you and I have both been posted in the same five continents, North and South America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. We've both also worked in every area of diplomacy, including cultural diplomacy. I was also in the Ministry of uh, Commerce, uh, like you. And, uh, uh, you know, in your view, you know, we've all done political, economic, consular, cultural diplomacy. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, uh, these such diplomats like us are today considered generalists. And there's a great call for specialists. But in my view, a generalist can make a very good diplomat. Would you agree? Yes, I, I agree with you totally. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, when you talk about a generalist, uh, the, the generalist uh, has such a more wide variety of uh, experiences. And uh, that helps to, you know, build, give him a broad spectrum view of a whole lot of things. Uh, the multilateralist, as you might call, is uh, sort of spending uh, much of his time uh, in uh, in multilateral cities, uh, you know, with the UN organizations, uh, either in um, New York or Geneva or Vienna or Nairobi. Uh, to that extent, no doubt they have other experiences, but they spend so much of their times, uh, you know, within these closed doors. And um, just to give you an example, I was Consul General in New York, and a whole lot of my colleagues were in, the, uh, in a mission to the UN. Now, uh, they have spent three years there. They have traveled from there all over the world. They haven't tra traveled in the US. And as Consul General, I had 18 of the states of the US under my jurisdiction. And I traveled through all these states. And for my great um, joy always was to go to the universities. And the one thing I really uh, envy about the US are their universities. First of all, their campuses, the sort of people they bring from all over the world. Uh, the best minds, I believe, uh, from, from those particular countries, both students and professors. And um, fortunately, this is one of the things I've been able to, I've been able to retain uh, in these contacts uh, with these universities and a lot of people. So even post-retirement, I have got invited <laughs> to a whole lot of universities, um, Columbia, Yale, um, Stanford, uh, Peking University, uh, Heidelberg. Uh, so um, I consider these, uh, for me, uh, very privileged moments, yes. Well, uh, thank you so much. Um, I'd, I'd like to thank all of our speakers for this rich journey, not only through the life of one of our most distinguished diplomats, but also through our nation's history in the decades following independence. Uh, you started with Nehru and you've brought us into uh, the 21st century with the United States. Um, thanks also to our audience for tuning in. Please join us for our next program on BIC Streams. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. <laughs>